Our next speaker is an assistant professor also at the Montreal Neurological Institute in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery. Um, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Gary Armstrong, who's going to present zebrafish models of ALS using zebrafish and cutting edge technology to create a better way of studying ALS in animals. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Armstrong. Hi, can everyone hear me? We can hear you and we can't see your screen yet, but... Oh, you cannot see my screen. That's odd. Uh, let's see here. There should be a button that says share your screen. Uh, I see, oh, not sharing anything. Show, maybe that now? Yeah, we can see it. Great. Okay. It's all yours now. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, well, uh, first I, I want to thank uh, uh, Dave and everyone else at ALS Canada for this wonderful opportunity to uh, reach a, a broader audience that uh, is not normally exposed to the research that my lab does. And um, <clears throat> so obviously my lab, uh, we work with uh, zebrafish and uh, you may have had these as, as children. Uh, you can get them at pet stores here in, in, in Canada. And uh, they get their name uh, because they have these five uh, stripy lines that run down their, their body axis. And historically, most people have not been uh, working with them as an adult animal you see here. They've been working with them at these larval stages here and they're traditionally used as a developmental model. But some of the research we're doing now uh, really takes advantage of uh, the entire lifespan of the animal. So uh, just to give a bit more background about uh, this model system, so these animals uh, are freshwater, uh, tropical freshwater minnows, and they inhabit the uh, Himalayan region of, um, of, uh, of India. And they live in these uh, slow moving uh, rivers and lakes, and they've been used as an experimental model since the 1970s. And like other disease models, um, they, they stack up pretty well. Um, so along this uh, y-axis here, this is the, the number of publications, and this is the, the year from 1960 to 2010. And this is the number of publications that have been uh, published using various animal models. And so you can see that both the rat and the mouse uh, dominate uh, the uh, scientific field. But in this small group here, if you were just to expand it to all these other uh, systems, uh, you would find a zebrafish. So zebrafish as a, as a model system has really expanded really since um, the mid uh, 1990s. And uh, some of the other model systems that are commonly used in ALS are, are Drosophila, the, the fruit fly, you'll see these around your bananas, uh, chickens, uh, obviously I'm going to be talking about zebrafish. There's also a C. elegans worm and uh, even a few studies on, on, uh, on tadpoles. Um, so, so why, why zebrafish? <clears throat> well, they're, they're easy to maintain. They have a, a quick uh, generational time. So they reach sexual maturity in about two or three months. Uh, the females uh, uh, are, have ex utero fertilization. So they lay their eggs and uh, they develop rapidly. And so this is actually a, a short video uh, showing a, a, of an egg that's just born in mor at the morning. So it's at nine o'clock AM. And this is the yolk sac here. And this is the actual uh, cell. It's at a one cell stage and it rapidly divides. And so this is over the course of the first 24 hours and uh, onto this, into the second day. But by the first day, you have an eye forming. This is the, the spinal cord. You get these kind of spontaneous contractions that occur. And at two days, the animal hatches. and after two days, when this animal's hatched, it has uh, basically uh, laid down a spinal cord and it can swim away. And in this spinal cord, uh, we have many identified neurons. And in an evolutionary sense, the circuitry of the spinal cord is shared uh, quite well amongst, uh, amongst vertebrates. And also importantly, for uh, as a, a model, they're optically uh, transparent. So you can put them in a dish and you can image them um, and, and record from them. And so these animals have rapid development. They also can be used as a, a wonderful drug screening tool. So this animal, by virtue of the fact that it lives in water, you can just apply a drug one at a time to test its uh, ability to provide you know, neural protection in the context of, of ALS. We have, uh, as, a, as a field, generated a number of transgenic lines. So you have, for instance, a transgenic line called HB9 that drives GFP. This labels uh, motor neurons or early born motor neurons. And then we have also uh, tools to, to edit the genome, such as the, the CRISPR-Cas9 mutagenic system, which I think probably um, a lot of people have already heard about. And actually, I'm going to be spending a lot of my talk today 
talking about CRISPR. So if you're um, uh, less familiar with them or have some questions about that, then, then I hope that I can, um, uh, I guess, put those uh, put those bed. And so, um, uh, and so my lab uh, studies basically two areas of ALS. We study uh, the the neuromuscular junction. So we know that is obviously uh, 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 altered and, and defective in, in patients with this dreadful disease. Uh, but we also study defects that occur in the spinal cord, synaptic defects that occur in the spinal cord. And uh, one of the reasons why we can actually do this is that the fish, uh, as a zebrafish, is very useful for investigating defects that arise there, that optical transparency. We can access it for uh, physiological recordings. And so this is a, a, a two-day-old uh, zebrafish that's uh, expressing uh, the green fluorescent protein under the control of the HP9 promoter. And this labels all the, all the motor neurons that are inside the fish. So here we have you know, the two eyes. There's the yolk sac. There's a heart here. And this is the spinal cord that runs down here. And you can see that it's green in this, in this transgenic animal. And so this is the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the spinal cord that runs down. And, uh, they have trunk musculature that runs down the length of the animal. And at each of these, because um, uh, I guess kind of like green outcroppings are, are the ventral roots that are coming out of the spinal cord. And I've, I've shown them in a close up here. So these are the ventral roots and these are all the motor axons that go out and they innervate the, the trunk musculature. And at the base of each of these ventral roots, you have the, the secondary motor neurons that you can see here. They have these very small cell bodies. This is actually inside the, the spinal cord, so it's a higher magnification. And then you have a couple of these uh, larger cell body primary motor neurons. And so you can uh, use this model to uh, record from them electrophysiologically to find out what's going wrong, wrong in the system. And so this is an example of a, a typical experiment that I did during my postdoc and that we're, we're doing now. And so um, this is a fish, it's, it's, uh, it's partially dissected. The, the head would be way up here and the tail would be way down here and the spinal cord runs here. And this is a, a glass pipette. It's a patch clamp electrophysiological patch pipette. And I've basically patched onto one of these primary motor neurons that's in the spinal cord. And it's just below the field of focus. And so I patched onto that motor neuron and that motor neuron, it sends its axon out to this region of the, of the, the trunk where the muscles uh, that are, it, it innervates. And so if I, uh, uh, basically, this is actually a live video. Um, if, I, if I inject current, you can do this trick in electrophysiology. So I'm injecting current into this patch electrode here and it's a, called a, a, a step pulse and I can generate these ash potentials. You may see some, uh, some blood going up and down here. There's the uh, caudal and dorsal uh, veins and aorta. But when I inject current, you'll see these axial You'll, If you look carefully, you'll actually see some twitching there. And you can use a second electrode to patch onto a muscle cell that you can't see here. But basically what this system allows you to do to examine the neuromuscular junction is you can inject current, generate an exponential, and then record the corresponding, what's called a muscle in play current. And so in ALS, we know there are defects in this synapse. And so we can uh, take advantage of uh, this model system to uh, really find out what's going wrong. The other thing you can do uh, in this model system is you can look at the descending you know, inputs from the hindbrain to those mo motor neurons that are uh, allowing it to actually swim. So, um, so this is again, that's that patch electrode. I patched onto a, a primary motor neuron. That's the, the cell body. There are many axons of this ventral root, other these secondary motor axons. But this, uh, this primary motor axon goes out to the trunk musculature. And if you were to give the animal uh, a touch of the tail, you would uh, cause it to uh, to swim, but it's restrained. So they actually, you might see this animal shaking here. The animal's trying to swim. Um, so there's there's obviously information coming down from uh, upper regions of the central nervous system that's uh, driving the motor network. And so this descending input is, is probably quite relevant for uh, the disease. And it allows us to record uh, changes in membrane potential. So this is a, a, a recording that I would make in, in my lab and showing over a, a eight second period, these uh, is a change in the, the membrane potential of that motor neuron. And so when it starts to swim, you get an ash potential firing and this general depolarization that eventually goes back to baseline. So what this, this basically allows us to do is to uh, examine defects in this descending input. So these are some of the basic physiological tests that my lab uh, do to investigate what's going wrong in the disease. 
But uh, just to come around and, and shift a little bit, just to remind everyone, and I know we've already talked about it today here, but 90% of uh, all ALS cases occur sporadically in the population. And, and we still know very few uh, of the genes that are involved in, the, in those cases. But amongst the familial cases of ALS, uh, which are the very, which occur uh, still uh, very rarely in, in uh, if you were to look at all the ALS cases, we now know about uh, probably about the majority of, 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 of their cause. And of course, Biggie's been C9, R72, and SOD1. Um, but uh, this is a, a list of the genes that uh, uh, basically are, are, are known. And um, my lab studies the ones here in yellow. So SOD1, TDP43, FUS, C9R72, and, and a few others. And for the sake of today's talk, I'm actually gonna focus on uh, the protein TDP43, and that's encoded by the gene uh, TARDBP. Okay, so interest in, in, in this protein uh, basically uh, came about in, in the mid 2000s when uh, uh, a group led by uh, Virginia Lee identified TDP43 TDP being the, the major component of the aggregates in 95% uh, of all ALS cases. So TDP43 is a, is a protein, it's normally found in the, in the nucleus, but in, 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 in ALS patients, it's redistributed. So the nucleus is in, uh, so this is uh, the nuclei of neurons in the dentate gyrus. And in, in these cases here with ALS, you have a loss of nuclear localization. So there's, there's blue, that's the, the nucleus, and you have these aggregates that are outside of uh, the nucleus. And it was a, a couple of years later that the, the first mutations in the gene encoding TDP43 were identified. And although they count for only a small portion of all ALS cases, uh, it has allowed uh, researchers such as myself to uh, make uh, um, disease models of this. And so uh, this is uh, the protein, what TDP43 looks like in a, in a kind of a cartoon form. Um, it's uh, 414 amino acids in length. It has a nuclear localization sequence that says uh, that instructs that protein to be in the nucleus. It has two um, RNA binding domains where it interacts and interacts with RNA. And it has this glycine-rich region, and it's in this glycine-rich region where you have a number of these missense mutations. And these missense mutations are caused by these disease-associated SNPs. So this is called an electrophrenogram. So when you get your DNA sequenced, you get uh, th this information that gets uh, produced. And uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a healthy individual, you should just have one peak you know, at, at, each of these, at each of these sites. But in, in, in ALS, you have these double peaks. And these are, uh, these, are these disease associated SNPs. And so for instance, this one here actually encodes the A382T variant that I'll be talking about later on. Um, so although we've been studying as a, as a group uh, uh, TDP43 for a while, um, we know that it's involved in RNA metabolism. It binds to uh, RNA that has UG-rich uh, repeat sequences, including its own 3' UTR where it involves itself in its own autoregulation. And a number of labs have been uh, modeling uh, these mutations either using transgenic models where they take a, a human gene that has a, a disease-causing variant uh, and they introduce it into a, a mouse, or in some cases, even a zebrafish. But in the last couple of years, um, basically this new technology, this CRISPR technology has allowed us to go in and make that exact same mutation in the endogenous gene of our animal model of interest. So I work with zebrafish. Zebrafish have a gene that encodes TDP43 as well. And what we would like to do is be able to go in there and, and make that mutation. And so, so, uh, so many of you probably already heard about uh, CRISPRs, but if you have not, I'll, I'm going to go over a bit of a, a brief uh, overview. So it's an acronym, and it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats and the CRISPR-associated nine genes, which are endonucleases that does the cutting. And <clears throat> basically, at this moment, we have about three different ways uh, as a researcher we can use to edit the genome um, in our, our model system. We have uh, zinc finger nucleases that are um, expensive and hard to work, work, work with. We have tailings that are hard to work with and we have CRISPRs and CRISPRs are super easy to work with. And so this is actually just an animation video uh, showing a, a DNA sequence here that's, uh, that's being targeted by uh, this uh, CRISPR molecule here. And so it finds your region of interest and it kind of pulls apart the DNA, 
And then in this region here, the endonuclease is going to cut the DNA on both sides. You'll see it. There's one and there's the other. Okay. So <clears throat> DNA does not like to be cut in this manner. And most of the time when DNA is cut in this manner, it gets rammed back together immediately. Uh, often when that happens, there are errors that get introduced into the DNA, and that's called non-homologous end joining. And this uh, technique is very useful if you want to go and disrupt a gene. You could also use it to remove an entire gene. Um, but what about trying to make a, one of these specific mutations, okay? So the mutation that I'm going to be talking about today is the A382T variant, okay? And it's very common in the island of Sardinia and in Italy. In fact, it's uh, the most common variant. It's more common than C9 or 72 cases on this island. And so it's well conserved in this region where it is, lies in the protein structure of this glycine rich region. So this is the, the human protein sequence, and this is the zebrafish protein sequence. This is the, uh, um, uh, the, the A here. And so what you can do as a researcher is you can design a CRISPR uh, that targets this region. And we want to ultimately try to make a single disease causing point mutation in the zebrafish genome. So you can design a CRISPR, you can inject it into a, a zebrafish oocyte, and it cuts. Okay. So these are individual. I should first mention this. This is our, our CRISPR target site. And these are different founder zebrafish lines that we generated using this technology. And uh, this is the DNA sequence. But what you're seeing here, so this is the wild type sequence, and these are all our founder lines. And these are regions of the DNA that's been deleted, and here are some where the DNA has been added. And this technology, although many people are widely using it, is really best for uh, basically removing, causing these deletions that you see here in uh, the genome of an animal model. And it's not a good model for making a single point mutation. However, you can trick the system, the repair machinery of the cell, by co-injecting a single-stranded oligo that contains your point mutation of interest. So you have your CRISPRs, and then you inject a little template piece of uh, uh, single-stranded DNA that has your point mutation, your disease point mutation of interest. And when, it gets, when the CRISPR cuts the DNA, this uh, single-stranded oligo gets recombined. It integrates in the zebrafish genome. And what you're seeing here is this electrophrenogram of a zebrafish that actually has that G to A point mutation being introduced into it. So this is a human with the A382T variant. And this is our zebrafish The has the equivalent mutation is the A379T mutation. So we have this uh, zebrafish uh, line right now. And um, uh, these animals develop a, a motor phenotype and uh, they die uh, prematurely. Now, granted, uh, most people who work with animal models uh, don't necessarily have to worry about the length of time an animal lives with. A zebrafish can live five or six years in captivity. And um, basically, our homozygous animals that have the three A379T variant, they die uh, prior to or just around three years of age. And so a one-year-old animal uh, in that's either a wild-type sibling or heterozygous or even these homozygous carriers of this ALS uh, disease-causing variant, uh, they look normal to, to us. Um, but as these animals age, uh, they lose muscle mass and they also develop a, uh, a motor phenotype. And so, um, as I said before, uh, these animals obviously live in water. We can use them for drug screening. And uh, one of the tools we use for drug screening is to put them in an aquatic arena. So this is a, a zebrafish, um, an adult zebrafish that's in, a, um, um, I guess, a, a tank of water, and it's, and it's swimming around. And you can use these heat maps to integrate uh, how far it's swimming and where it likes to be. And so a, a, a wild-type sibling, such as this one here, um, swims at a, uh, you know, a, predicted, a predicted speed. But when you look at our, our, our uh, heterozygous or our homozygous carriers of this analogous AS, ALS-associated variant, you find that uh, they do not swim well. You can also look at the spinal cord. And so this is the spinal cord, a slice section of an adult zebrafish spinal cord. The blue is DAPI, so that shows all the individual nuclei of the neurons and glia that are in the spinal cord. Uh, the CHAT stands, uh, stains um, uh, uh, all, basically all the motor neurons. So you, can, so you can see some motor neurons here in the, in the blow up. And in red is our, our TDP43 stain. So 
in in our um, in a wild type animal, TDP43 is normally localized to the to the nucleus, so it should be right in the nucleus. But what we find is that there's more cytoplasmic mislocalization in our variants, and so you can see that right here in the merged in the merged um, the merged picture. So um, just to kind of uh, wrap up this uh, part of my my talk. Um, as an experimental animal biologist um, who studies ALS, we have two basically systems to study disease. We can rely on traditional transgenic approaches where we take a human gene and we integrate it into uh, the, uh, the, the, our, our animal model's uh, um, genome, or we can go in and we can actually edit the exact piece of DNA uh, to make a disease-causing uh, variant. They both have their pros and they both have their cons. Uh, the pros for transi trans traditional transgenesis is that uh, we're expressing a human gene. So, you know, although TDP43 is relatively well conserved between a fish and a human, uh, there are some differences, notably in the, 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 this region of the, of the protein. Um, some of the cons associated with these traditional approaches is there's often multiple inserts. There's often overexpression of the protein. You don't have a lot of control over the expression patterns. And of course, you have the endogenous gene. So even though you're making a a transgenic model, there is still a mouse gene there. There's still a zebrafish gene there, depending on the animal model you're integrating with. And of course, with the CRISPR technology that I talked about today, uh, the pros are that you're utilizing the endogenous promoter. You're looking at the same gene that has normal expression patterns. Um, and uh, the cons though are is that you know if the analogous edited SNP, it has to be there. You can't make a a mutation um, if if it's uh, not even uh, well conserved in, in your model of interest. And the other uh, big thing that I want to point out is that it's, it's actually still a little bit of work to knock in these uh, these uh, or recombine these um, these um, these SNPs in the zebrafish genome. It actually only occurs about two to five percent of the time. So. Um, Many people have come up to me in the past and asked me, well, what is the utility of using this technology for a uh, potential therapy? And unfortunately, the, 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 that is a, that's a, a wonderful question, but unfortunately, uh, the technology isn't there yet. Um, we would need to get this to basically 100% um, to ensure that we're fixing our, our, the human mutation in the patient. Um, Anyways, with this, I just want to um, wrap up my talk today and thank, obviously, the ALS patients and their families who have contributed to my research over the years. And my team is here, and these are my past collaborators. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to address them. Thank you very much, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, really appreciate your talk today. Uh, very quick, one question. Sure. Um, so, you know, as we learn more about ALS in terms of its genetics and even perhaps beyond the familial disease, uh, do you think the CRISPR technology would be viable, um, you know, if we increase in efficiency um, to uh, start to do models perhaps that are multigenic variants as long as the those variants exist, as long yeah. as those that exist in the zebrafish genome? or? Yeah. So you're, so you're thinking if we were to find, say, like two or three different mutations in different regions of the human genome. Yeah, that, say a sporadic patient that, or a sporadic individual that had, you know, uh, three or four uh, that, that might end up being something of a genetic susceptibility um, for ALS. It would this be a model that could be potentially a first way of testing because it's a little faster than, say, making a mouse that's that? all of those yeah well that's, a, that's, an, ex, that's an excellent question um i i do think you know this the the crispr field as as a, as a research field is rapidly changing and i i do think that uh, we will be getting close to you know I mean, there's going to be technology that can actually make these uh, edits uh, that i showed you today a lot easier and a lot more rapidly um so i absolutely think that we could use it, this tech technology or uh, either uh, subsequent iterations of it to uh, examine questions that like the ones you just you brought up, but we're not there yet. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Armstrong, for your time today. Thank you for the presentation, and uh, we wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Likewise, and thank you, everyone.